In early October 1790, King Leopold II of Austria traveled from Vienna to Frankfurt to be crowned Holy Roman Emperor. Frankfurt had been the traditional coronation city since 1562, and its 28,000 citizens suddenly found themselves welcoming some 80,000 coronation guests. Imagine any modern city taking in a crowd some three times the size of its own population. The problem of lodging was solved simply by requisitioning just about every free bed in town. The emperor and his retinue took up residence in 12 houses. The walls were broken through so they could walk from one room to another. The quartering officers have not yet arrived at my home. I hardly dare step outside the door and find myself sitting here in this glorious weather as if I were in the Bastille. Were they to find me absent, these resolute gentlemen would probably take over the whole building. That was the mother of the poet Goethe, apprehensive of things to come in her own hometown. Throughout the coronation period, there was a full program of entertainment. Parades, military maneuvers, wandering players, an Italian opera company, a marionette theater, clowns and jugglers all played their part in the festivities. Fireworks, garden parties, reenacted battle scenes were the high points on the schedule, and there was plenty to eat and drink. The special kitchen was set up to grill whole oxen, and a fountain poured forth red and white wine free of charge. The whole city was like a carnival at night, with the houses illuminated by thousands of torches and oil lamps. On one single evening, there was a huge fireworks display along with magic lantern shows featuring several thousand lanterns. Everything was oversized. Most of the grand palaces had allegorical transparencies projected on one of the larger walls, and all the first families competed to be more lavish and extravagant than the people next door. Then as now, Frankfurt was one of the richest cities in the world, and when it came to putting on a spectacle, no stone was left unturned. The usually sober-sided city fathers went to work, making their visitors as comfortable as possible. Even ladies of the evening were available in abundance. As a matter of fact, these goddesses of love proved a mixed blessing, wandering through town in huge swarms and grabbing every male who wandered by, regardless of whether he was in the market for their favors or not. Safety precautions were also taken. 10 battalions and 14 squadrons were put into position from Frankfurt to nearby Hanau. Skirmishes between the soldiers of the various electors had also become an old coronation tradition. Revolutionary France was a particular source of concern, what with the storming of the Bastille only 15 months in the past. Any number of French immigrants had come to Frankfurt, where they were suspiciously looked upon as disquieting messengers from Paris. Of course, this exorbitant spectacle had its share of vociferous critics. Despite all the poverty here, the taxpayer still had to foot the bill for this show of pomp and circumstance. This coach, which took Leopold to his coronation in grand style, was a particular bone of contention, with rumors all over town of the taxes being doubled to cover the cost of what they thought would be a once-only luxury. More than one spectator was appalled at the sight of the usually grim-visaged Germans taking advantage of the situation to prance around like slightly demented children, while the populace walked around in rags and tatters to pay for it. Many members of the Viennese court were in the official party accompanying the emperor, a party which included representatives of operatic and theatrical life. Maestro Salieri, the court composer, and Maestro Vranitsky, 
musical director of the court theatres. But one name was conspicuously missing from the list. Mozart was certainly disappointed to be left out of the official delegation from the Viennese court. On the other hand, it wouldn't have been protocol to take Mozart and leave behind the official director of the court music, Salieri. Nevertheless, Mozart felt strongly enough about attending that he paid for the journey to Frankfurt out of his own pocket. It was a journey he could ill afford. He had to use his own carriage, and it took him away from his beloved wife. So why did he do it? Frankfurt was an important city on every level. The great political and cultural figures of Europe gathered there, and there was an enthusiastic audience for theater and concerts alike. Several of Mozart's operas had been popular here for years, La Finta Giardinera, Seraglio, Figaro, and later Così Fan Tutti and the Magic Flute. In Frankfurt, he was able to meet up again with several old friends from Vienna, Munich, and Salzburg, and it was here that he saw an opportunity for playing concerts and making some money. As always, he had a sample case of masterworks along, among them this supreme composition, his Piano Concerto K459, a work which gave profound testimony to his musical maturity at its absolute apex. This third movement starts out with a sprightly little melody that could have been downright innocuous in the hands of a lesser composer. In mere seconds, however, Mozart takes the listener in and out of one musical world after another. Without once breaking stride, he moves brilliantly from major to minor, from a pleasant, almost flippant mood to a melodic development of intense seriousness. Just as he once demonstrated his skill at musical mechanics as a child, here he displays both an uncanny harmonic deftness and at the same time an artistic profundity in his handling of the very fabric of music. Knowing he had this incredible level of proficiency at his fingertips, he got to Frankfurt in the highest of spirits. As he enthusiastically wrote his wife, We've just arrived at one o'clock in the afternoon, so the journey has only taken us six days. We could have done it more quickly still if we'd not stopped at night on three different occasions. We're staying at an inn in the suburb of Sachsenhausen and are in seventh heaven at having secured a room. But so far, I don't know what our fate will be. I mean, whether we shall be together or be separated. I'm longing for news of you, of your health, our affairs, and so forth. I'm firmly resolved to make as much money as I can here and then return to you with great joy. What a glorious life we shall have then. I will work, work so hard. 
that no unforeseen accidents shall ever reduce us to such desperate straits again. With all the funds being lavished on every phase of this coronation celebration, the wealthy burghers of Frankfurt could have commissioned an opera from the man who composed the concerto we just heard. What they got, however, was this. This opera is called Axur and was composed by Antonio Salieri. He had brought this two-year-old work along in his sample case for the occasion. Ironically, his opera is based on a play by Beaumarchais with a libretto by Lorenzo da Ponte, the same people who supplied Mozart with the words for the immortal Marriage of Figaro. But what a difference in the music. Stories of Salieri's wild jealousy of the younger composer, however justified it might have been, were pure fabrication on the part of later generations. In fact, only a year later, when the same emperor was making the rounds of his domains being crowned king of Hungary, Bohemia and so on, Salieri was asked to contribute an opera for the crowning in Prague, but politely declined, suggesting that Mozart was the man to approach. The opera Mozart composed was La Clemenza di Tito, and the first performance, given in the presence of the royal couple in Prague, was graciously conducted by none other than Salieri himself. The visit to Frankfurt that had started out on such a high note was beginning to cast the composer into a spasm of gloom, the likes of which he had never experienced before. His fabled resilience in the face of frustration and disappointment was beginning to shatter. Instead of making the rounds of potential noble patrons the way he used to, he just longed for his wife and family. If people could see into my heart, I should almost feel ashamed. To me, everything is cold, cold as ice. Perhaps if you were with me, I might possibly take more pleasure in the kindness of those I meet here, but as it is, everything seems so empty. I'm as excited as a child at the thought of seeing you again. A rather peculiar attitude. Instead of seeking the company of the great and influential, Mozart simply retired to quarters and unenthusiastically wrote a couple of pieces for flute clocks. He limited his personal contacts to a few close friends. I made up my mind to compose the adagio for the clockmaker and then slip a few ducats into the hand of my dear little wife, and this I've done. But as it's a kind of composition which I detest, I've unfortunately not been able to finish it. I compose a bit of it every day, but I have to break off now and then because I get bored. And indeed, I'd have given the whole thing up if I had not such an important reason to go on with it. Up to the present, I've been living here altogether in retirement. Every morning I stay indoors in my hole of a bedroom and compose. My sole recreation is the theatre. 
where I meet several acquaintances from Vienna, Munich, Mannheim, and even Salzburg. Already I'm being invited everywhere, and however tiresome it may be to let myself be on view, I see, nevertheless, how necessary it is. So in God's name, I submit to it. It's probable that my concert may not be a failure. I wish it were over, if only to be nearer the time when I shall once more embrace my love. The state entry takes place tomorrow, Monday, and the coronation a week later. The coronation took place on the 9th of October. The day began with a wild ringing of bells at six o'clock in the morning. The city gates were closed, the civil militia took up their positions. A magnificent procession escorted the emperor to the cathedral where the solemn coronation took place to the sound of Regini's coronation mass, conducted by Salieri. This was followed by a parade through the city, marked by trumpets and drums and accompanied by a 100-gun salute. Every window had been rented to spectators. Homeowners had actually broken holes through their roofs, even the corners of their houses, to accommodate more people. A few days after the coronation, the emperor left Frankfurt and the city began cleaning up after the celebration. Mozart had not been invited to provide music for a single event. No wonder he didn't much feel like writing a major opus at the time. Finally, on the 15th of October, he did manage to get a date for his own concert. But now, with the emperor gone, everything must have seemed anticlimactic. Even so, the concert presented a grand and elaborate program. Two symphonies, improvisations by the composer, arias, two piano concertos, K459 and this one, K537, both given definitive readings by the composer himself.
My concert took place at 11 o'clock this morning. It was a splendid success from the point of view of honour and glory, but a failure as far as money was concerned. Unfortunately, some prince was giving a big déjeuner and the Hessian troops were holding a grand manoeuvre, but in any case, some obstacle has arisen on every day during my stay here. But in spite of all these difficulties, I was in such good form and people were so delighted with me that they implored me to give another concert next Sunday. I shall therefore leave on Monday. Although the admission charge for his concert was fairly high, Mozart obviously didn't derive much profit from it. The concert started relatively late. Many of the officials had already left town. When lunchtime rolled around, apparently much of the audience just wandered off. What was Mozart thinking while all of this was going on? He poured his sorrows out to his wife. If you could only look into my heart, a struggle is going on between my yearning and longing to see and embrace you once more and my desire to bring home a large sum of money. I've often thought of traveling further afield, but whenever I tried to bring myself to take the decision, the thought always came to me how bitterly I should regret it if I were to separate myself from my beloved wife for such an uncertain prospect, perhaps even to no purpose whatsoever. I feel as if I'd left you years ago. Believe me, my love, if you were with me, I might perhaps decide more easily, but I'm too much accustomed to you and I love you too dearly to endure being separated from you for long. While I was writing the last page, tear after tear fell onto the paper. But I must cheer up. Catch! An astonishing number of kisses are flying about. I see a whole crowd of them. <laughs> I've just caught three. They're delicious. Just as he once wrote all his thoughts and feelings to his father, he now confided it all to Constanze. If only Leopold could have lived to see the tremendous inspiration his son received from a woman for whom he had so little use. In fact, we owe much of our knowledge of Mozart's creative process to her meticulous preservation of everything he wrote and her collaboration with her second husband on the first full-scale biography of the composer. At this point, however, her support in this dark trial was as important to him as his father's encouragement had once been. Almost always, Mozart was affected more by his passionate feelings for his wife than by his worries about money. But as ever, when he turned to music, he rose above worldly anxieties. K459 was the sixth piano concerto he wrote in 1784, and it is just impossible to have a favorite. They're all perfect. It is truly astonishing that he never seems to have had a bad day. This concerto, like all the others he wrote, contains melodic lines that could have been written for the voice. In fact, Mozart was never far removed from the voice, no matter what he was writing.